Hi gang, as you're joining, if you've got questions or things you want to show off, feel free. Anybody have exciting updates on what they've been working on? Nobody? <laughs> Everybody's been taking the last two weeks off. <laughs> I've been working, getting ready for shows. My first show is in uh, New York in a couple of weeks. So, oh, fun. My focus has been on that. Great. Yep. Yep. I'm not sure I'm ready for show season again. I have two back to back on opposite coasts. So, we'll see if I survive that first pass. The first one will get you going. Yeah. <laughs> it's no, the one in New York. The one in New York I've been looking forward to going to for a long time is my first time doing it. It's the Lindhurst show that Art Rider does out there. And it's the top of their, why do they have to like 12 or 15 shows they do a year? And I've been trying to get into it for years oh. and finally did. So I had to go. Great. Yep. That's Which, hard. Because you always spend all of the money on booth fees and all of that. And it's like, oh, why didn't I get in? Oh, yep. that's really <laughs> Yep. I consider them contributions at this point. <laughs> right. Did way too many contributions this year. How long is the show weekend or what? Uh, uh, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. It's uh, up at the Lindhurst Estates in Terrytown, New York. It's a beautiful, beautiful setting. It's an outdoor show on the, on the lawns out front of this estate. Um, and it's been one of their longest running. So um, mm -hmm. I have friends who do it regularly and they have a good customer base there. I'm hoping I can build one up as well. I haven't done much on the East Coast since I moved back West. So I like stay in touch with everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a couple of minutes past, so it looks like we may just have a small crew this time. We'll see if people join as we go. Um, welcome back all. Uh, I'm gonna do the usual reminder of the various links and so on in chat for those who need it. Um, if anybody hasn't joined us before, this is a fairly casual affair, so you can interrupt with questions as you see fit. Um, when I'm at the bench, I don't always see them on chat, so uh, you can call out if you need to. Um, just take yourself off mute. Um, I popped a couple extra links up there that I haven't put up before. If you're looking to sign up for my mailing list so you know about other classes and what shows I'm doing and so on, uh, the, the where to go link has everything from class registration to the mailing list registration to anything else that you might want about my social media and so on. Um, all the recordings to date are up at the YouTube channel. So you can go there if you want to catch up, if you missed a session. Um, the workshop series is in there. Um, uh, the workshops I've got scheduled this year. Uh, my next one is a hollow forms in silver workshop. Uh, and then I just got confirmation. I am teaching virtually for metal works in July. And that's going to be uh, a clasps class, which is going to cover a whole bunch of different types of clasps. Um, not the same clasps that I cover in my, my most recent class. Uh, and then the one that is really relevant to today's uh, activities is Bezel's Less Ordinary, um, which in which I do a lot around um, some of the fancier settings that we're going to do one, one of the hybrid settings today, but um, uh, I go into a bunch of different variations on the theme there and I'll show you some of that. I'll give you a teaser for what's in that class. Um, uh, if you haven't joined the Facebook group, uh, it's a slow moving group, so it's not like you're getting heavy traffic from it, but when you get, it's got a lot of the um, li reference links for places to get stones and materials. Um, it has the organized groups uh, or guides rather for all of the different chapters we're doing. We're still chugging away at chapter three. We've got a couple more weeks on that, I'm a couple more sessions on that, and then we will move on to the excitement that is uh, prong settings in our next chapter, but we've got a couple of unusual settings coming up before that. Um, last session was entirely devoted to the devious and troublesome Emerald Cut. And so, barring any questions, I'm gonna go do a little bit of a redux on what we did last time and um, talk about what I have done since and what I plan on doing going forward because I still don't have a nice finished Emerald Cut um, setting for my board. Um, so, for the good news, this is what we have done to date. A lot of little settings, all in chapter three. Just going to bring that along. 
varying uh, heavy, varying gauges and so on. Um, and the triangle is missing because I uh, managed to chip the stones I was setting, so I'm doing another one. Um, I'm almost done with that and I will replace it. And then it's missing its little marquee, I mean, a little uh, um, uh, emerald cut setting. It's waiting for it to join. Um, if you want to see any of those up close, you can speak up. But for now, we're going to talk about what I did last time. Um, this is the emerald setting that I did last. And I had to do a lot of um, repairs on it as we were going, as you may recall, if you were in attendance, um, having to cut some things down. I am not pleased with the fit of it. While, the, while I could set the stone in this, there's a little bit too much gap at one edge. It may actually be two sides of it. Um, so I need to get uh, either either get up the nerve to repair this another time or just redo it. Um, and I've been playing with John's setting and I am of the opinion that I do not particularly care for his method of measuring using the images that we did a lot of talking about last time. We talked about how it need, you need to correct some of the notations in that portion of the book because um, it's not as clear as it could be. Um, so I've gone back to what I was originally taught, which is um, working from a side and working our way around, so halfway. Um, and I'm not doing measurements when I do this. I'm doing a piece at a time and measure. I mean, I'm measuring. I'm just not doing the measured out strip that John recommends because I'm just not getting quality measurements. I'm not precise enough. Um, so I'm still using his double wall method, method number two, where we make the um, the step bezel with a shoulder bezel wire beforehand. Um, but I'm, I've taken to doing, I usually try to start on the long end. Um, but in this case, I don't know why I did. I started on the, on the short end, halfway down one of the long sides and then framing my way around a piece at a time. Um, so you can see I'm working on another one. I just, I'm not quite done with it. Um, but I need to get that material measurement down a little bit better. And, uh, and John's way isn't isn't making it for me, so I'm not going to keep spending hours measuring things out. Um, what else did I learn about this? Uh, it really is all about using that three aught tiny little blade as your only means of getting your corners in um, instead of using your files. So it's a little bit at a time, and it, you just have to have patience with it. Um, John says in the book that he wants you um, soldering each point as you go. I haven't been doing that. Um, I find that it makes it harder to get in to cut the final cuts if I've soldered it all the way around. Um, I don't think I have any other lessons to share. Just that I've thrown a lot of these across the room this past couple of weeks. So <laughs> what time I've had to spend on it has not been fruitful. Oh, okay. But I will get back to it and continue my attempts to get better at emerald settings. Um, triangle setting, again, this is the one I'm working on. It just isn't polished up yet. Um, I think I'm now of the opinion that when doing uh, emerald cuts, I will be doing them with the two-part method. And when doing triangles, I'll go back to my tried and true method one, which is the two separate walls. Um, I just like the fit I'm getting better uh, when I make an exterior wall and set an interior wall into it. Uh, so that's my personal take. Your mileage may vary. Um, I'm still on the fence. I think teardrop and oval um, are, and rounds are probably easier with the two with method two where they're pre-made um, just because there are fewer steps once you get there but I could go either way on those. It's sort of a tie, especially on, on rounds, since it's pretty easy to make a round fit inside of a round. Um, questions about any of that rambling that I just did? All right. So, um, sorry, okay. Rachel. Go ahead. Did you say you're going to stick with the, um, the single step bezel for emerald cuts? I'm going to do the method two, which is the yeah, okay. pre-make your, pre your double wall and then measure and fold because, okay. by God, I don't want to have to make these teeny tiny corners twice and oh. make them switch into each other. So, yeah, my take is that for emerald cuts, I'm going to continue forward using method two. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Did I hear somebody else starting to ask? I missed last class, so I'm a little behind. 
it, it, it is up on the YouTube site, so you can take a look at it. You will see that it is nothing but working through the Emerald Cut and the many challenges it presented. We had several uh, setbacks where I had to cut down through a seam in order to repair it. And yeah, it was challenging. And it will continue to be challenging until I've done another hundred or so, I suspect. Um, mm. That's when it starts to make sense. So, but it's there. We, that's what got us to this point. And that's it's very it educational. Good. Yeah, I love Good. watching the YouTubes, but Good. for some reason, I don't know, for some reason, usually post it and I must have missed it. Yep, it should be up there. Okay. Um, so we're on, we're doing session seven now. So yeah, it should be up there as session six. Um, we didn't have, uh, th this was our first month where we had a double week off. So that may have confused things for people um, oh. because it was a five, five Wednesday month. Uh, and I think it is this time as well. Um, so yeah, I got two weeks between to practice instead of just the one. So anything else before we jump into the first of today's settings? Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, so this is the rough crystal setting. We are on page, doo -doo -doo, page 75. And in this next, in the series that we're doing right now, John gives us almost no guidance on it, except that it's possible. Um, so I'm going to uh, do the, I'm going to talk about the couple of ways that I approach these. Um, the first thing that I do is I look for, even if it's a rough stone, I look for something that is as flat as possible. It becomes a lot more challenging if you don't have some kind of level to that. There are many, many ways that you will hear people discuss to level out a stone if you, um, if you have something that's not well cabbed for you. Um, these kinds of ideas include, you can actually sand it down, um, grind it down, if, they, if it's a stone that's not too fragile to do that. In this case, I'm using a chunk of amethyst and I could probably manage some grinding if I wanted to. Pretty, pretty please make sure you have the right mask and ventilation systems if you're gonna be grinding stone. Um, silica dust in your lungs is permanent and no joke, and um, there's a lot of nasty stuff in stones, so you got to be careful with it. Some people um, and some traditional methods include packing the back of your bezel with um, some kind of material, most often sawdust. I personally abhor that technique because I have yet to meet anybody who doesn't get their jewelry wet at some point, um, and then it swells and it creates issues. Um, and not to mention gathering smells and so on, but it is a, uh, it's a historically traditional way of backing it. So it's gotta be doing some good for some people. I just may not have found the right way to accomplish it. Um, I had an instructor who liked to stuff dead pieces of, pieces of dead credit cards. Um, she would just chop up the plastic into a shape that would support it and put those in back as long as it was not a transparent stone. Um, I, you can also, in many cases, build a little ring or frame that fits on a part of the stone and solder it into the base of your bezel so that it gives a little lift where it needs to. Um, depending on the shape of it, of the back, it may be better as a step bezel than as the traditional, we're going back to the basic bezel that we did in the first place. But sometimes a step bezel will help you because then you have room for all the uh, protrusions of the back. Um, to help you out. Uh, and John gives us two different styles of edging on this. He's talking about either the cutaway um, method where you're following the pattern or where you're making a lot of fine cuts. It's often called a castellated bezel, although sometimes people are picky about that and say it has to be, it's only, it can only be castellated if there's sections taken away between. Um, to my mind, if you put a cut mark, that is a section away. Um, and so the bottom right picture is that castellated style. And that can be done with a saw blade and just careful slicing. Or um, one of the coolest tips I got indirectly from Anne Havel, from some, one of my students who took one of her classes, is that you can set up, um, if, you, if, you get a, if you get a bezel mandrel, excuse me, if you get a uh, mandrel for your um, burrs and you put two separating discs separated by a washer, the distance apart that you want your slices, you can use it to keep very nice, precise spacing when you're cutting the little castellation lines. Uh, and it makes for really precise work. 
Um, she uses those in her tab setting of enamel jewelry, and it's quite cool. Um, in this case, because of the shape of this rock, I'm going to actually do the sheet metal and a rough cut. And so what I've done is put a bit of masking tape around the framework. This is not for determining my length so much as it is because I wanted to trace the highs and lows of the stone. And when it's a crystal formation, what I'm looking for is where is a spot that I will be able to push down some material without crushing a crystal or without butting up directly against the crystal. So I'm looking for a combination of, of design of what's gonna look nice and what's gonna hold the stone. And you can get away with fairly little material holding it as long as sort of three opposite points minimum are held into place. Some stone shapes you can kind of get away with two if it's a well-shaped stone, you know, if it's like, a marquee, you could get away with points on either end, but it's not as durable. It's if, if a, an area comes pulled up in some activity someone's doing, it can easily fall out. So all I'm doing is sort of finding the material underneath and seeing what I want to do with it to both display the crystalline forms and wherever I have an opportunity, have what becomes a sort of sheet metal prong to push in. I don't know if we can see that terribly well in here. So I've got a dip in the crystal right there. So I'm making an up point at that spot. And then wherever I have a sharp crystal coming up, I wanna go around it instead of um, trying to wrap over it because it kind of defeats the purpose if I don't show the crystals. So that's my step one. And then I'm gonna have to take this apart and lay it out on a sheet or slide it off. Again, it's not perfect for sizing. So I'm still going to find an end and decide a spot that I can make it a little longer than anticipated. So either a low spot or my highest spot where I can solder things back together at the seam. I'm going to take a low spot in this case. I'm cutting it apart. And I'm just going to lay it out on a sheet. I think I need to go this way because I don't have enough. And I'm trying to keep one side flat um, for a nice backing. You know, I'll be putting this side down to the backing. And then I'm going to um, just be cutting out my rough frame. It does mean that I have to reposition it exactly where I've taken it down. So I really should have paid attention to whether I was cutting at a point or not, but we'll see how it goes. I'm gonna go a little bit beyond the point. So I give myself a little spare material and a little bit extra here. I don't know if you guys can see, but there's a smidge for the sake of sanding and filing if I need to. Um, in this case, I'm going to be sawing because getting this kind of a crazy line uh, without, you know, by, by hand cutting on such a tiny little piece of material is a little challenging. Um, Tape stays down. And if you are having challenges with an awkward amount of sawing, you know, this, this weird back and forth shape, err on the side of taller than you want it to be. You can always file back down to fit the shape that you want it to be. So I have a question about the tape itself. Yep. Um, the tape is thinner than the material you're using to saw out. Does that matter? That's why I gave myself a little bit of excess material for my like kind of looping around in case it was too snug to the piece. Okay. okay. So it's, it's not a perfect match, but because I'm using only 22 gauge in this case, it should give me a rough outline. Okay. What I'm looking for, again, it's not the length as much as the, um, the layout. Okay, thank you.
see my short little saw, so I may have challenges exactly where, how, where I want it to be. I'm gonna have to come in from the other side because I only used the two and a half inch or three inch saw. Just like the break the blade to get it out. That's one way to do it. This last little bit I'll have to trim up once I get it into place. If I can get the saw around it. All right, so now I've got roughly a little frame that has a lot of the shape I was looking for. The thing I should have done was marked my low point so I knew where I was starting on the rock. I'm going to now have to sort of reverse engineer from that to see. What was I thinking about where the design will fall? Something there. So what this doesn't, uh, what the what why I needed that extra length is it doesn't really account for the bends in the material that I'm going to have. Which in this case I've got a point, so I'm going to have to do some filing right there. But I can get my rough shape. And see how it goes. So you can see that I'm going to be fairly well well fitted just from that little bit, and I have a little leeway to trim it back. But I want to figure out where my exact layout spots are. Yeah, I did go in the corner, and I'm going to put a mark where I want to make my bend. Now you can absolutely find your tallest point on your, on your stone and just make a band that is that wide and then cut away a piece at a time. In this case, with a rough shape like this, I just, I like the speed with which I can um, map it out with a piece of tape, but nothing says you don't, you can't do it in stages. You could, you could make a thick, solid wide band and then just choose pieces to trim away. You can trim them away with a saw, you can trim them away with drill bits if that's easier for you, especially if you're working on something heavy gauge, it might, might be easier um, to just sort of grind portions of it away. Um, you can do a combination of the two techniques that John shows on that page. You could do some of it with the sort of tab creation, the castellation and some of it with larger, wider portions that you just cut away. So what I'm doing now is giving myself a bend point, same as we would do on any other style of cornering that we've done so far. We're just putting in a starting mark. In this case, it's a little sharper than a square, so I can and then start with my triangle and then improve it from there. And if I stay on my line. And even though this is an abstract shape, it's still beneficial to get your bend if you can on a, on a fold like this by pushing against your pliers, your parallel jaw pliers. So you can see I still get a sharp corner in there, but I need an even sharper corner than that. Let's see if I can get it with what I've got. It's not too bad. The difference between working on a, a faceted or cab stone that's nice and neat is that you need to account for all the little divots that are in the stone as you go. So once you've got a starting point on it and you have something like this, like I've chosen the corner to do, you can take a pair of pliers or um, some kind of soft, you know, not soft, but uh, 
not aggressive shaping tool. Like in this case, I might take a dapping punch and just push in where you have indents. Make sure that you're starting to follow the shape of the stone closely. Because if you don't get some of your indentations as you go, um, it's gonna be too gappy by the time you get all the way around. So what I'm doing is finding ways to put, there's a, there's a little indent after I get around the corner that I need to follow. And then I come to my other bends. I gotta see what I've got for positions. I'm just sort of using whatever tools I can to squeeze to the shape of the stone as closely as I can without breaking the crystals underneath, which is something I have a penchant for doing if I get too aggressive with the bend with the with the pliers at this stage of the game. And sometimes it's a little bit of an undercut that you're tucking under. Always make sure that if you've got undercuts, you can still set the stone in and out of your piece. Because if it's too deeply undercut, then you're not going to be able to um, lift the stone in and out if you make it too snug of a fit. So getting the rough shape, making sure that my highs and lows that I wanted are sort of still lining up. It's looking pretty good. Looks like this corner has not quite such a sharp bend as I put in. So I'm gonna open it back out and figure out where I put my half round pliers. I, use, I do um, more with my half round pliers than probably anything else when it comes to subtle shaping of things. Because you can, you can use it on its side angles. You can, you can use it on the full, full curvature. It gives you a lot of different choices for shaping that other pairs of pliers, other shape suppliers don't necessarily get you to. One little dip in that it needs to take. So you're not going to saw the corner like you have in the past. Uh, on this one, it's got it. So it's a little hard to see on camera. This was a nice sharp corner and that one I sawed. This okay. one has a bit more curve to it. So I'm trying to not get too aggressively sharp at the corner. Okay. Um, so that one, I, I just did the bend with the pliers. Sort of a judgment call. It doesn't hurt if, if you wanted to put a little bit of a saw mark in there to help encourage it, that would be okay. It's gonna depend on the shape of the stone more than anything else as to whether I decide to corner it or not. This corner could probably use a saw just to get a sharp enough turn right where I need it. Oops, except that my marker has died on me. I'm not actually getting any marks. Hang on a sec. Pen, there we go. And the thing to remember is that you're not gonna get necessarily quite the same snugness of fit that you would see on a, um, on a more shaped stone. Um, and it's and that's probably okay as long as it's snug enough where it counts to hold the piece down. Meaning it's going to look gappier in some places just because of the the shift of the stone back and forth. It's not it doesn't have a, a flush edge that your metal is right up against, um, and so it can sometimes create. Uh, a sense that you that it's not fitting as well as it really is. What you're looking for is do you have have you have you gotten beyond big pullouts? And I'm going to bring this over to my good camera because that did not make any sense when I said it. So I got to show you. 
Let me get to the good camera. Okay, let's see how we are. I'm not, also not spotlighting myself, which will make this bit much bigger for you guys. Uh, spotlight for everyone. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm hoping you guys can see it. So there's a little bit of gapping. Close. So see that I've got some gap still up in this top corner. You can see my hand beyond it, even when I tuck in close. So I want to get a little snugger in that upper corner right over here. I can't tell if you guys are what I'm seeing. Um, and when I have it fully closed, there's still some edge gapping in here that I need to play around with uh, going in and out of camera. I don't, hopefully you can see behind, see yes. how my finger shadows it, right where that shadow happens right there. I need uh -huh. to get my uh, material pushed in a little more snugly there and at the big corner, um, just so that I have a good clean fit. So it's not that it's going to be everywhere is completely free of seeing down to the bottom of the rock because it's an odd shape. You just want to get it as as well fitted as you can before you're going to solder it to, in together in place. Rachel, sure. Could you anneal the bezel to make it more pushable? Absolutely. This one is it, I buy my material dead soft, so this one is already in pretty good shape. I'm able to oh. manipulate it with my hands, but if it's biting you, by all means, go back in and anneal it, especially if it's a big piece that you're doing a lot to. Great call out. So some of this is about finding the very specific little tiny adjustments that you can make. So that corner that I didn't like the fit of, I just needed to get a more of a zigzag in there. And it will become more and more challenging the better your fit is, because when you have those cutbacks, they make it like this piece that I just bent now makes it hard to get around the rest of it. And this is a stone that I have to still be able to get in and out. If I tuck too far back under for this section, because it's a cutback, it'll keep the stone from being able to get in and out once I put it all together. So same as with any other stone, if you can't set it by the time you're done, it kind of defeats the purpose. That corner needs a little bit of a bend back as well. All right, so now we are down to a little bit on this side. It's a good looking bend, and I'm much happier about that fit now. Now I just have to figure out where I'm gonna trim it to on this last bend. And you can see that little bit of extra that I cut for myself was critical to make those cornering bends. I need it to get connected, but I also didn't, because I didn't, my saw bumped up against the wall, I need to trim it back to what it actually needs to look like, something that has a nice shape to it. So on this you... stone, it was about two millimeters extra that I put on beyond what the masking tape was. You can probably figure out mathematically based on the thickness of your material, what you need to add. Was there a question? Well, I just, yeah, there is. I, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> um, you're right on kind of a corner there. Mm -hmm. Would it have been better to go up a little further on that side? You probably answered that question earlier, yeah. but I missed it. it. No, it would have been. That was when, when I first was pulling up the tape and I went, oh, shoot, I should have really marked where I was starting. That okay. would have, It would have been much better to start somewhere like this would have been a perfect spot halfway yep. along the long wall. Yes, okay, absolutely. Perfect. Try to avoid doing a corner. Okay. Otherwise, um, I, it, for me, it would be a hair pulling event. It, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's going to be a tight solder. And if you put too much solder there, it makes that corner especially hard to set. Um, I'm just going to trim this little tiny bit that I have to off with my shears because I can get to it. Yeah, I think I'll leave that at that height and maybe file it if I don't like it when it's done. So back to my bend. 
And in this case, my fit is such that I'm gonna to have to do a tiny bit of filing once I've got it um, soldered together. Yeah, take, take the tape off. You could burn it off, but I always hate burning stuff near my face when I don't have to, you know? Masking tape isn't the worst thing, but better still to not have to do it. Um, I just gotta to touch up my seam connection a little bit because it's not, quite where I want it, and my little guy. But the actual connection looks like it'll be pretty solid there. Yes, I would not advise making your seam this close to the corner. Okay, on to the soldering. As with any such starting, if you're not using IT solder, you should be at least using hard solder. I'm sorry, I, I probably wasn't on the right camera for all of that tweaking I was just doing. Am I on the bench cam? I am on the bench cam. There we go. And uh, a little bit of flux. My flux brush, there we go. Again, with silver, not so much with gold, but with silver, if you've got a seam line and you are worried you've got a little bit of spring to your metal, start on the opposite side with your heating and it will help sort of force the material at the seam to push together. If you, especially if you see you're, you're doing jump rings for chains and things like that, and you see it often trying to separate on you as you start to heat, it probably means you need to start heating the back side first and then come to the senior setting. Okay, back to our bench. Because now we have the basic frame. Take it off first. And the magic is, can we still put the stone in from above? If not, we're gonna have to rethink some things. Ooh, I may not be able to, I might have to rethink some things. Oh, did I do it the wrong direction? No, I did not. Okay, so at this point, ah, uh, there we go. I have a little bit of reshaping to do because it distorted a bit with the heat. So I can get it in from above, but only if I'm able to manipulate it a little bit. So what I need to do is figure out the spots that need to come out and figure out the spots that need to be straightened up because that's the other problem that can sometimes happen is that you can tuck under your material can get tucked under a little bit, um, meaning it's not as straight upright as it needs to be because of all the manipulating you've done with it. So I'm just gonna go through and using flat pliers, straighten anything that I feel I can torque. I'm not describing this well. The walls may have done this and tilted. So all I'm doing is squeezing to straighten them upright wherever I can, being careful to not get rid of any of the interior curving in that I've added to it. So I'm not gonna hit these corners. I'm just gonna hit the walls themselves. See if that gives me a little bit more of the leeway I need to get my stone in from above. Yeah, it's still a little bit snugger than I'd like it to be to get in. So I may have to pull some material back out. And some of that is easier to see from the back where I'm choosing where it goes in versus where it needs to pull out. Giving myself a little bit more room, but not too much. And figuring out where it's catching. Okay, so now we're looking good for getting it set in from above, which is critical, and nothing is too far gapped. And I'm fortunate that this is still remaining fairly flat because I started with a nice flat um, edge, a, a machine cut edge on the other side. 
If not, I would be going and doing a little sanding and filing on this. Um, but now I'm just going to grab a back plate, remembering to stamp your back plate if you want it marked with your mark. I have to scrap this the right size. Nothing says you can't do mixed metal on this. You know, put a copper back plate if it's something rough that may might look a little more interesting with some mixed metals. This out a little bit. Do all the usual checking to make sure that you will have a nice flat surface. If you do not, you need to straighten some things out further. In this case, I have one wall that wants to lift up, which means I've still got some torque in it. So I'm just bending it out again. And I have, if I ever have to change the walls, I need to check that I can still fit my stone in after I've made that adjustment or else I might be unhappy about it once I solder it down. Okay, we're looking good. Popping back over to the soldering station. I'm gonna use medium. And do I have a lot of medium cut? I did not have a lot of medium cut. Medium. In this case, I'm using wire solder. And I like to solder, especially if I'm doing uh, um, opaque stones, I like to solder from the inside of my bezels. I tend to do that 99% of the time from the inside, even if it's a transparent stone. Um, because the mess won't be seen as much. Different people have different thoughts on whether they like to solder from the outer edge or the inner edge. I just wanna do as little solder cleanup as I possibly can. I'm also using um, paste flux for this. And one of the reasons I like the paste flux, and I know some of this is repeats for you guys from who've been attending every session, but it helps to remember this thing. Um, the paste flux in particular, when you're working with like hollow forms or heavier gauge bezels, it can act as both a glue and as an indicator of where your solder can go. So especially when you're doing the last of your hollow form close-ups, you just take your, um, your flux and get it to the white crispy state. And then when you lift up from that, I don't know if it'll show enough on the screen, there's a little frame that shows where the marks were. So if you can't easily see inside, or if you need to heat up your piece because you're working with very distinctly different size, um, you know, wall versus back plate. So your bezel material is not, uh, is, you, you need to heat up your back plate more because it's got so much more heat resistance. Then you can put down your solder before you put your bezel back in place and still it know where it belongs when you're done. Um, with these, as with other bezels that I'm putting down to a back plate, I'm gonna not quite put my um, solder right up to the wall because it has a tendency to wanna melt up the wall then if you overheat by accident. So I like it a fingernails width um, away from my wall. And I'm gonna have my handy dandy steel pliers in case it tries to start lifting off. I'm heating back plate more than the walls if possible and center my heat in the inside because it becomes a little convection oven. It's got a little too far away from the wall. I always try to avoid getting the first flow to happen near my seams from the outer wall. What I'm looking for is for the material to start flowing and then going around to the outside. I may have just sent every piece of solder up the wall. I think I just did with me.
looking for that beautiful little glow as the solder flows underneath. We call it the sunrise effect. It's like sun coming up over the horizon in the morning. Just goes swoosh and flashes across. All right, so we've now got the back plate all attached. Going to quench and pickle that. And again, if this were a much rougher cut of stone, I might at this point pause and design for it a little seat of some kind for some or all of it. It might be a matter of soldering down a little plate in one corner of it where it lifts up more, or it might be making, making a little coil of metal or a circle of metal that rests down. It might need to be something that you take a thick wire and you hammer one half of it thinner than the other. So you could make a little frame that sits inside of the stone and just flatten either by rolling mill or by hammer the edge that needs to be lower so that you take care of your tilt by lifting up. Think of it as shimming, just like you might in a tent if you were setting a tent up or under a table, that kind of thing. So build the shims in. Some people like to leave those shims loose and just, you know, tightly fitted, but not soldered down. I personally prefer to have no moving parts under my stone because if it starts to move at all and rattles, um, the customer might be unhappy if they hear noises coming out of their piece. Um, that's pretty much all there is to a rough design like that. I'm gonna now trim out the outside. You can design your piece where you're gonna trim it directly up to the, edge of the wall or you can give yourself millimeters all around it and put in some patterning design or what have you. It's the same principles. You just have to, when you're working with crystals in particular, you have to be careful when you're setting that you not push too firmly down over the crystal formations because they're, they're very rough in there and they have fracture mark, fracture points. You know, when we get a cut crystal, it's often just pulled off of the main rock in some in some way, either falls off or you know disconnects from the, the base material it's on. Amethyst in particular is gonna want to fracture on you if you push too hard. So gentle, gentle on your setting. And we'll we will set this as part of the setting day that I'm gonna do um, so that we can show what it actually takes to do that. I don't tend to go very heavy on my bezel walls when I'm doing something like this. I tend to sit around the 22 gauge. Um, I don't like to go much thinner than that. 22 gauge is enough to hold if it does have movement in it still. It'll be like you have a little more durability once you've pushed it into place. Um, but that's that's all there is to that. There's, you know, there are other ways you can prong set it. You can use what we're about to do next, which is a com combination of a bezel wall. If you're, if you're not sure about where, how much pressure those crystals can take, sometimes you just make a frame and then add prongs at a couple of key points around the stone so that it's just barely held in by those prongs because those are a little bit less pressure on the stone. It doesn't need to be a full bezel wall. Questions about that? Okay, let me see if it's ready to come out of the pickle. Oh, I forgot to turn on the pickle when I got into the studio, so it's going to be a few minutes. We're going to let that one go for a while in the pickle and talk a little bit about modifications to the settings we've been doing thus far. So page 76 up at the top, John teases us horribly by drawing a whole bunch of really beautiful drawings and then not telling us how he does them. Um, that's why, that's why I cover some of that in my, my November class. Um, the hybrid combo has so much potential. If you are, if we get into the prong setting and you're super nervous about making basket settings and things like that, go back to this chapter and start playing around with variations on this theme because it's a, it's like a gateway into the prong world. And frankly, there's a whole lot more interesting stuff that you can get out of this than a basic basket looks like. Um, so what we're gonna do is uh, add some prongs to one of the settings. And I've got a couple, we've got a couple examples that I've done of the kinds of variations he shows in here. These are again, not set, I gotta bring them to the right camera Bear with me. So these all start their lives 
as basic uh, shoulder bezels. So I think this oval may have been one of the ones I did during our sessions. But all I'm doing here is adding, in this case, round wire prongs at four points. It could be six points, it could be two points. Because I'm leaving a lip and this is gonna be partially bezel set, but also have the prongs for added stability, I don't necessarily need to have a whole lot of prongage. I can have them for decorative effect. They're really cool when you do them in other metals, like you could do brass or gold prongs on a silver frame and it comes out quite elegantly. And he goes into a lot of how can you tip your prongs in the later cha in another chapter, um, but it could be a pointed, it could be a split prong. There's all different decorative elements you can do in just adding the prongs to it. Um, what I do in setting up for prongs is I trim the um, amount of wall that I would have if I weren't using prongs down to a bare minimum. I want almost nothing left. This is actually a little higher than I would normally leave it. I should have trimmed more away, um, but I was in a hurry. So uh, once that sets down, it's just gonna, I'm gonna be doing the regular setting a little bit and then adding the fold over of the prongs. This too started life as a basic shoulder bezel, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like it was made in multiple parts. Um, this is in fact starting as, let me get one of the ones that's not yet cut. It's starting life as a tall bezel, sort of like this round, just for the oval, and then cutting and filing portions of it away. I do this without killing my stones. So you can see that it still has its outer wall and its inner wall. It's just that some of it has been cut to trim away and make a false facade on it which you can create with series of, of saw cuts and filings. Um, and it still has the durability of having a seat that the stone sits on. And then when we set, we're gonna set from these areas that are taller, okay? So those are some of the kinds of variations that you can make. And John has drawn a bunch more. The prongs alone, you can go crazy. Are you using pattern wire? Are you using square wire? round wire, half round wire, um, multiples, are you mixing your materials, all kinds of choices. My camera's not switching on me. So that's where we're headed next. Any questions about that? All right, we're gonna do the most basic of these, which is using half round wire to create the prongs. So I've already prepped this and you should have done all your sanding and filing and polishing on your base step bezel. Doesn't matter whether you make it using method one or method two, just finish it and get it looking clean because once you put the prongs on, it becomes a lot harder to get rid of scratches and so on. And I am going to find my circles templates. Circles templates are super handy and come in a bunch of different shapes. You can find more than just circles. But what you want is one of the ones that has indicator marks on it for the, the compass points. And some of these, there are, there are devices out there that have more than just the four corners. So if I wanted to do a six prong, I could. Um, there's lots of other tools out there to help you measure it. Or heck, you don't have to do these equidistant. You could do two on one side and one on the other. It's just if they're going to be the primary means of holding the stone in, make sure that you hit at least three points in most stones. Some stones, again, can get away with two. Um, but you really need it to not be able to slip out. The, the deal is that no width that is in the stone should be um, narrower than the gap between two of them, because otherwise if it comes loose, it can slide out between those two prongs. So from my layout here, going with the most basic, I'm going to mark my quadrants so I know where I'm putting my stone. Rachel? Yep. We can't see. Oh, sorry. I'm sitting here measuring and waving my hands and everything. 
Thank you for that. So device with markings on the quadrants. And I'm just getting the one closest to my snow, to my piece. Uh, that's probably a little bit better fit right there. And I'm just going to mark if my good pens don't keep wandering away from me. There we go. I'm going to mark my quadrants so that I have the four equidistant. And then I'm going to use a square to make sure I have a nice straight line up this. At each Rachel, of when do you put your seam? Uh, where did I put my seam? So when making this bezel, um, I probably did this one as a um, two-parter. So, oh, no, this was a one, but this was the method two. So my seam is right here. You can cover your seam if you want. Um, you don't have to, if, if it doesn't show after you're finished soldering and so on, uh, and sanding and so on, then you don't need to. But if it's convenient to hide it, go for it. If I'm doing a, um, a round instead of a half round, I'm more inclined to go across the seam because then I'm drilling in a little divot for it to uh, set into and it so it um, is a little bit more solidifying of the seam when I cover it with another piece of material. But for this one, it's flat, so I'm not too worried about it. So there's, I've got my four corners, my four points. And the next thing I'm going to do, having already straightened this so you don't have to watch me straightening my material, I can either cut each one and do it separately. Or when I'm doing a cross from each other, I like to do a, a U-bend over something. If you've got something around that's approximately the same dimension, just give yourself a little loop of material that's going to be enough to go from side to side. So what I'm looking for is it's doing that and not much more. Down just a little bit below the stone edge because I need something to support it in my um, brick. It's one of the reasons I like working with bricks. Um, and then I'm going to trim it off at enough that I have both sides. It will whoop, <laughs> slippery little sucker. Um, I have enough material for both sides. And this is definitely the quick and dirty approach to this. You can always, always measure each one very specifically and put them together in a, um, a little like setting material or something like that, just to get yourself each one precise. I like this on equidistant settings because it's self-sustaining. Basically, once we get it in the right spot, as long as my metal is straight, which it's not right now, as it is flattened instead of trying to stick its way out, they basically stand in place across from each other for you. So I'm making sort of an upside down basket in this case. And I need enough curvature at the top that it'll hold itself in place once I put it down. There's one set and then I'm gonna make the other one a little taller so that it can go over. and making sure that they are in fact flat because otherwise you're going to have a hard time keeping them straight as you solder. OK, 
Downs are probably the slipperiest of these guys. So notice that I've done one a little taller than the other. Not much, just enough that the other one can slip underneath. That's what I'm going to do is set them up like this on my brick, like a little croquet set. There's a name for those. What are they called? Wickets? Setting it up like little wickets. All right, and this is where, again, having a brick comes in handy because you can make little connection points into your brick. see you are going to have to make sure that they are as upright as possible so this one's got a little bit of a warp out i need to straighten the leg so it's snug against the material i'm soldering it to Make sure it's lined up with both your seams. I mean, both your marks that I that I made previously. Not tight enough. So I'll get that a little snugger. Don't dig it in deep enough. You can also set these up with binding wire if you prefer. Or as we'll learn when we do the actual basket settings, John has some cool mods for our uh, cross locking pliers, a little harder on such a big setting as this. Come on, stay upright. Rachel, why not do them just one loop at a time? And Could do that. It's because I like to get it over with. Because <laughs> I, I, otherwise I have to remark once I've got one in place and I get uncertain about whether I've got them lined up. And, but yeah, absolutely, you can do one and then the other. There we go, now we're stuck in. It's just a matter of lining things up. I'm making sure we're upright. Okay, so I'm looking really good on my upright. I'm going to carefully, carefully flux. And probably at this point, we're on safe bet is medium solder, but you could try hard solder um, if you are confident that you've got good control over it. I'm going to go with the medium for now. And again, remember that you will have trimmed back your upper bezel wall a lot more than you would if you were not adding prongs. I'm just putting this right at the top of each point and I'm going to flow it down the setting. You want to be fairly generous with this because it needs to run all the way down 
and encompass the whole prong. left out of the prong. Well, this one is not, it is, there are days that are soldering days and there are days that are hammering days. This one may be a hammering day. Because, man, I'm having to get this way hotter than I should. Yep, every single one of them except for one going on the outside. Come on. This is some seriously sop sloppy soldering, gang. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. I'm glad one of the settings we're doing today doesn't require soldering. We're going to get to see a repair job again today because one of my prongs is way out of whack now. I gotta quench this and get it pickled before I do more on it because it is way too grubby at this point. It's tacked down, but that's about it. One of the prongs is warping away. So give that a moment. Meanwhile, I will pull the other thing out of the pickle while that one is cleaning up. We'll show where that one is. Yikes. All right, so we're back from the pickle from number one. And again, if I were planning to do some kind of design around it, I would trim it away or saw it away accordingly. For the sake of this activity, I'm gonna just trim the plate entirely. And I'll do some filing and sanding between sessions so that it looks nice. The, um, this is one where I will do my rough trim with the shears, but because it has cutbacks, I'm going to have to come in and do the rest with the saw. So I can only get so far or with filing if it's just a little cut back. So we've got our basic bezel there. And you can see how it's designed to come up the walls at points where it doesn't interfere with the crystals. So it's gonna come up over there. It's gonna come up over there. The corners are gonna get a little bit pinched closed. And I'm gonna to have to tuck that corner down back in the back a little bit more. There we go. That's why I was not fitting. I had to click in. So corners are gonna get pinched closed when we set this one. And then the larger lumps are getting pushed in. The whole thing is getting pushed in, but the larger lumps are geared to come over the frame of the underlying rock to hold it in place. So there's that one. Let's see if we can recover on 
the prongs going sideways. Ooh, nope, that needs more time in the pickle. Questions while we wait for that to get cleaned up. Um, I have a question sure. about that amethyst. Yep. So could you, if you cut the corners completely so they were open, yep. would there be enough bezel to hold the stone in? I would probably either, on this stone, the way that it's shaped, I would probably either add a couple prongs at key points that come a little higher up the stone and over, um, or I would make the high points come higher up enough that I like, there's a, it's a little hard to see on this, but there's a spot where I could bend into the stone more. As long as I have three key points, even if they aren't the corners. So like one on each side of this roughly triangular stone mm -hmm. holding it in place. Yes, it will hold. Um, but it also, like the corners on this particular stone are some of the ugliest parts of the material because it's where it's mostly oh. tipped away. So you want to so, cover them. Yeah, I want to cover them. <laughs> I want the crystal to be the star. Um, so yeah, you can see that it's mostly the rough rock and that's what I'm trying to cover up. Oh, this camera just really doesn't want to focus on that. Uh, but absolutely you could design this with cutaways on that as long as you've got enough support elsewhere on the stone. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. When I could, I suppose I could be visible. I'm visible. <laughs> when you are fiddling with your soldering, like just now with the overlapping four corners, do you yep. ever add more flux to your work while it's hot? Because obviously it disappears. Yeah, so flux is a really great thing. It, it can act as a cleaner. Um, so if you put it on at the right time, it can absolutely help clean up uh, and guide where the solder is going to go a little bit better. I was just getting so grubby on that piece that it really needs a proper cleaning before I go back at it. Um, and what had happened was when, I, when the first one went awry, it started to torque off center. So I, I could see that one of my prongs was now warped a little bit. Um, and so between that and the grubbiness, I just wanted to get it clean and I'll pull one of them off and set it again. Um, no. but flux, flux is one way to clean as you go. Uh, and then, um, the other way is to remember that on the, on the acetylene, not on the air torches, you have that three phase segment of the torch flame and the outermost segment where it starts to get bushy and orange is going to act as a deoxidizer. So if you just pull your torch back a little bit when your piece starts to get dirty, it can start to self-clean because it's burning off all the stuff that's that's carbonizing on there, that's oxidizing on there. Um, One so, other yeah. question about shaping those. If you use a magnesium block, would it make sense to not have the arcing? Could you just put four pieces into the magnesium block and would they hold? Uh, so the, the question of would they hold is one, uh, I'm using this because that you can put push things into it. So maybe it's not showing well on camera, but I like the brick for the same reason a lot of people like the magnesium blocks. They tend to have a very specific pinhole size. And therefore, if you're working anything bigger than that, you're kind of out of luck unless you want to destroy your, your brick a little bit, your block. Um, but yeah, if you, can, if you can press into something and you wanna do it single one at a time, the reason I personally like the arch is because it keeps the two in relation to each other, opposite each other. If I'm doing, if I'm doing four separate prongs, I have four chances to get them out of, out of their orientation. If I'm working on a set of them together, I know that at least those two I've gotten opposite each other and those two I've gotten opposite each other. So I might accidentally slip and make them be out of out of four corners with each other, but at least they're opposite each other. If that makes sense, got it. It's personal preference. Both it whatever works for you to hold it is what works. And probably I would have been better off sharpening the ends that are underneath the bezel a little bit to give myself a little more support. It's probably why it slipped a little bit on me is I didn't take the time to go far enough into the brick. 
Um, and when we get to, again, when we get to uh, um, basket settings, you'll see that for small scale wire, um, John has a really great modification that lets us hold those together. He does all of his basket soldering up in the air in his tweezers. And it's sort of magical to watch him do it because he has, he ha he's like, what's it, what, who's the wonderful Indian many, many handed God, <laughs> goddess? <laughs> That's what he's like when he's working with his tools is he's got five hands at least. I can never hold things the way he holds things. Any other questions? Okay, let me check Notice, the people again. I have a question about sure. just the soldering process. Yeah. I notice you pick up the little solder, you put it on the pick and you add to it. I do if I don't feel like I have a big enough piece. Um, in that uh, I use, so I've got a mix of different solders on my block right now. I have some um, wire solder that I've cut and I also have been playing around with, Rio has um, this microchip solder, which is like the size of glitter flakes. Um, and so I have, I have a mix that I'm picking up and if I pick up a, a little piece instead of a big piece, it can help to add more but I'm balling it up before I put it into position is what you're probably seeing. Yeah, so you wouldn't like pre put the solder on the prong before you put it on the bezel? Um, you mean sort of a sweat solder situation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I am contrary to many, many artists, I am not a big fan of sweat solder and there are very few instances when I use it. Um, okay. because it has a tendency to at once distort the surface you're trying to solder to and, and also commit you to a stick down in ways that frustrate me. Um, in that, like if I'm doing a big, big flat piece to another big flat piece, I'll do it, but I hate doing it because if you don't get your solder to flow quickly, you, you have this little cave between the two pieces at whatever distance the solder has lifted off. And that can create an oxidation in there if you're not fast enough with your reflow um, that makes it hard to get a clean solder all the way down. So I prefer to try and do all at once soldering if I can. Um, the exceptions are if I'm putting a pre-made bezel on something, I might put on my back plate, I might do a little bit of partially flowed solder and position it and then get it to reflow. But yeah, um, in, the, in the case of the prongs, I really, really don't want anything. I can actually show you the one that is problematic on this. So this one warped and lifted away, right? I don't want anything extra in there making a chance that it's gonna slide when I'm soldering it down. I wanna have it flow through the seam. And solder, on silver anyway, solder really wants to um, follow the line. Um, it uses capillary action and follows whatever the, as long as you've got a tight fit, whatever your capillary path is, it's going to give that. And so that's what I'm trying to do by setting up the prong. And so I'm just correcting it to be more flush, which was probably my initial problem, um, so that I have a good closed seam. And I can see a gap in there when I'm looking, holding it up. So I'm gonna flatten it further. Yeah. Definitely got a little too much gap in there. So let me try and tighten this up. And because I've had to muck around with it, I'm gonna check that I'm still on target for my quadrants. I might as well, while I'm, while I'm at, at it, check that I'm back in line. I'm looking good if I can get this solder down. Still got, I still got gapping, so it's gonna be challenging. So at this point, since you're going to re-solder, would you cut that part there where you're working I on could, right now? I could, but I trust my ability to solder it 
up and down better when it's held by this cross section. If I were to cut it off, if this were tacked down, absolutely, I could do that. Um, and I have had to do rescues where after it's soldered, I have to get it to flow and with my tweezers, tweak it back into place. Mm -hmm. um, but because I've got the, this one flowed well enough, I can keep it as a support system to hold that back in place. I kind of right. like it as a cage like that. <laughs> well, we're going to get to those fun things. There's a, there's a really cool project I'm looking forward to later in the sequence where um, John has us make uh, brass plates that let us make a bunch of essentially this round in smaller scale, this round setting in batches where we, we put a four set four or six or however many you want pieces of wire into a into a frame and put our tubing inside of it and then solder a whole batch of them at a time and then snip them off. So you're making this kind of a, a setting. All right, back to the soldering, but I'm gonna go side on now so that I can get better access to the ones that are problem children. And before I forget my flux, plenty of flux. Um, the other thing, if you haven't learned this about paste flux in any case, this is not true with all fluxes, but paste flux has stages that tell you more about where you are in the soldering process than you might realize. The white crispy stage is when it's time to put the solder down to the piece. And then as you continue heating, it gets either clearish or reddish clear. Oops, I'm out of medium solder. I used so bloody much on that last one. Um, as it goes to that reddish or clearish state, it's telling you that the metal beneath it is reaching temperature um, and it gets kind of glassy. And when it starts to get glassy, that is the point at which your solder will start to flow under the metal. And if it disappears altogether, you're getting a little too hot. It means you've gone beyond having any protective material in there. Because really, most of those fluxes are made out of, I think it's a borax base. And that glassy stuff should stay on there, at least in part, until you've gone and cleaned it up. So um, if you're trying, if you're, if you're fairly new to your soldering world, it's really good to get familiar not only with the color shift of the metal, but also with the color shift that you'll see in your, in your flux. So we're going white crispy. Once the bubbling stops, then it's time to start putting solder in place. And so, yes, I'm picking it up on the end, balling it up, and that gives me a little bit more focused spot in which I can place my solder. So I'm gonna to touch up this one that needed a little help, but not too much extra solder. And then I'll fix the one that was completely disconnected. See if I can clean any of the extra solder off while I'm at it. Yeah, I'm not going to get the clean up, but at least we got that one tightened down. And it's just the one that really is missing. Maybe soldering it off. There we go.
just trying to encourage the close fit. There we go. That was what it needed. A little squeeze to get it in place. Double check all my other seams. I'm happy with that. That one. This one could use a little bit more solder. Give some flow. All right. Better. Okay, that one's going back into the pickle. And then we're going to do an initial pass of trimming it. We'll trim off the base and we'll trim excess leftover for what we think we're going to need to uh, actually set the stone. And I tend to not do my final trim until I know I'm actually ready to set because then I can decide later. What I, whether I want a point at the top or a balled out end, or I want to do a split setting of some kind. There's all different kinds of fun prong variations that you can do. So that was the basics of adding on. Again, worth playing right first. If you're, if you're going for the first time on one of those, use half round, because then it's just a matter of flushing it against. If you are wanting to get a little fancier, with round wire, you, what you want you want to do is um, either file or drill away a little channel for each of your quadrants that you're putting the um, wire into, and that actually supports it even more and gets you a better solder seam. Um, if you're doing fancy wire, you just want to be really, really careful and light touch on your solder. Uh, that might be a case where I would pre-solder the inside of my um, of my wire, even though I'm still going to put it in place in similar ways, just so that I have less chance of flowing excess solder into the pattern. Um, but think about it, if you've got scraps left of, you know, ring, ring pattern wire that you've done is often uh, a pattern on a half round file, a half round wire, it makes great prongs from the scrap. Um, and what else do I think about when I'm doing that? Uh, the nice thing is that you can even do some decorative cutting away of the uh, outer wall of the bezel if you have prongs in addition to support it. Um, so play around with the variations, I guess, is what I would push you at um, and, and have fun with it. It's, it's a great stepping stone. And don't think about it as an all or nothing. Um, a lot of my more abstract stones I set in a combined um, bezel prong. So I'll do. Uh, a wall on, like I have a lot of pieces that I use with moon shaped, um, you know, like half moon shaped druzies and so on. And so there's a, an open druzy at the top that has the equivalent of our crystalline formation. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on it. I put a half bezel on, on the, on the um, polished side, the, the half moon side, and then I put prongs off of the top of it and make a combination setting. And it's a lot of fun and it, and it shows the stone nicely. So what's going to hold the stone is your first priority, and what's going to look nice in the design is the second priority. Questions? Okay. I'm going to take that silence as moving on. Um, I have a question, but I just stuffed okay. something in my mouth. Okay. <laughs> then I'll take this opportunity to have some beverage while I wait. I see. So um, this might be obvious, but when you put prongs on the bezel, do you ever push the bezel down then? Or yes. Be yeah. In this particular setting, you, you could get away with not, but then why bother making a whole wall? Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but 
yeah, but that was why I said at the beginning that you that you file down your your outer wall. If I were doing no prongs, I would have enough wall to really come all the way over the curve firmly of a of a stone. I can get away with a little bit less because I'm just putting it inward pressure, and then the prongs are holding it down, so I can make my outer wall relative to the inner wall a little bit shorter than I would. Um, let's, let me let me draw that one for you what I'm describing because it's not obvious unless you can see a piece close up. I've upgraded my whiteboard to an actual whiteboard so we can see if we can get some good drawings. So if we've got a stone, a cabish, traditional cabochon, and we are making a regular step bezel, go for this. So we're making a regular step bezel, right? It's got this kind of a frame to it. And what we need is to come to that uh, one third to uh, one quarter to one third is what John's taught us in the earlier sections of this book. If it's heavy gauge, you go down to the shorter, right? Because it's the heavy gauge is not going to move as much. But if it's like a 22 gauge or a 20 gauge, um, you're going to go a little higher up. And so when those fold over, they do this. That's a traditional bezel, but we're about to add prongs for extra support on top of that. That's a really ugly prong. So in that case, we can back down to just enough to start hitting our curve so that it's kind of gripping it. And then the prongs will do the extra fold down. Right, so it's trim it back a little bit from where you were. Wow, those are terrible looking prongs. It looks like something out of a sea creature movie. <laughs> Let's see, let's try that again. So our prongs that we've just put on come up and over beyond it. And so we're, we're pushing this in by the nature of pushing on our prongs, but I will also push it in all the way around just a little bit. I don't, want it, I don't want dirt and stuff to get trapped in there. So it's just pushed down at the height that the bare minimum height that I need. Does that sort of answer? Yep, that's great. Thank you. All right. Anything else on these settings? Okay, we're going to do a super duper quickie. We're going to go through a couple of the tube setting options. And John poo poos on page 77, he poo poos how you can only make certain size heavy wall bezels unless you make your own tubing, which is something that's worth learning how to do because when you need it, you really, really need it. But boy, I would not want to make all my tubes. I know a lot of people who do, a lot of professional jewelers who consider it a point of pride that every bit of tubing they make, they make. Um, but I would rather have seamless tubing. So if it comes in a size that I are, that is already out there, I'm going to, by God, be using it pre-made. Um, so I'm going to do the version of the setting that you can do if you have heavy walled tubing of exactly the right size. And let's look at the stones that we're gonna be doing this with. So we're gonna do first one that is drilled into a heavy wall. And this is a quick and dirty, add some extra settings to your nice piece of work. You just wanna to toss a stone on there or something. So I've got heavy walled tubing and I've got a stone that I know is going to rest within the frame of the tube, but not fall into it, okay? So I have to have tubing that's at least the right size to not drop through and gives me a little material when it's left over. I'm gonna make sure it's flush. This one's already pre-flushed for me because I was doing some work with them yesterday. And um, the setting bits that you can use are numerous. You can use either a traditional setting burr or you could do this with a round burr. But what you want is a setting that is uh, 0.02, 0.2 millimeters less than your stone. If you can get it perfect, if you can't get it 
err on the size of side of a smaller bet burr rather than a larger burr. Because if you make your setting too big, it will fall in. But if you make it too small, you can sort of work the setting a little bit to get it to fit. Uh, let me find my chuck key. And so the nice thing about the heavy walled tubing is that you can just pretty much go straight into, once you've got the match of stone to setting, now drop your stone, um, is you can just get it set up so that you can do some careful downward drilling. Uh, I would either cut off some tubing and put it in um, some kind of a clamp or um, tape it down to something and then uh, use my drill press so that I get a nice upright setting, but whatever you do, you want to be straight up and down. And you want to do just a little bit in and check your fit because you don't, it's really easy to make these go too far in. Um, and then you just have to sand away a lot of top material. Almost. So this burr that I have is ever so slightly too small for this stone. Better, again, better safe than sorry. So I can't quite fit it in there with a straight down um, solder, uh, st straight down drilling. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of work to sort of work this one around. It's just the tiniest of back and forth. And you got to grip that pretty firmly or else it's going to start spinning on you. And in the course of that, I went down a little further than I meant to. So almost when in doubt, take, oh, it must be good enough because now the stone doesn't want to come out. Uh oh. <laughs> there you go. So when, when you've got that little amount of room that you need to fix on it, if you have a handheld drill, like either a, a drill holder, a drill, I can't, I don't know the name of the, of the tool, but I will show you one of them so that we can see how it works. If you have something that you can just put a burr into with a handle, handheld. Pin vise. Yeah, pin vise, thank you. That's what it's called. Um, then hand, hand cranking out the last of this if your pin vise is strong enough to hold it. This pin vise might not be doing the trick. It's too loose of a grip on this size burr. Let's see what else I've got. Um, but just doing a little bit of the movement, if it's, if it's ever so slightly too tight when you're done um, drilling it, you can take your, your hand vise and sort of work the, the setting a little bit like this to just widen it out a little bit, but you want to do it by hand at that point so that it's ever so slightly adjusted. Maybe I can do it while gripping it. I don't know where my better pin vise is. So just reaming out a little bit more material around the edge just to get enough of a fit. And you just want it resting right below the top, and then I could go and use a setting tool, a burr set, I mean, a setting punch, one of these, and set that in there. If you're working with stones that can withstand heat, I know a lot of people who preset diamonds and just make boatloads of little settings with the diamonds in them because they can withstand the heat as long as they aren't treated in certain ways. Um, and then they just have them to solder down to their pieces when they need them. Um, so you can make these in a, in a bunch of different tube sizes and, and stone sizes. That's literally all that you have to do for the most basic setting, tube setting. Um, let's see if I can get that stone out. But John says, ha, you will not always have the tubing that you want in the size that you want. So why not? use nested tubing. Well then, John, you need two different sizes of tubing that you don't have. But in this case, I happen to have <laughs> two sizes that nest. And here is the critical part. When we say nest, we mean nest. Like it should be hard 
you should feel some friction in putting the other tube inside of it. Don't get something that kind of fits because any gapping you have is going to make your fitting not work. There are companies out there that sell sets of tubing specifically called nesting tubing, where the outer diameter of one or the inner diameter of one fits just inside. Reverse that. The outer diameter of one fits just inside the inner diameter of the other. So they sell them in relation to one another. Um, there are fewer companies making them and fewer sizes being made than used to be. I think that Halstead still sells them. I think Metalliferous stopped selling them. Anybody know of other places that do still sell the nested, heavy walled in particular? Anyone? No. Okay, so what we're looking for, let me bring this over to the other, to the good camera. What we're looking for is the ability to nest it so snugly. Yeah, it's not really gonna show for you guys, is it? So snugly that it just creates the inner wall for us. Okay, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be cutting off a piece of each of these. I'm just oh, cutting off a piece of each of these, one shorter than the other to nest inside. And it's gonna create, just like when we built one, it's gonna create a little landing pad for it. This will work for faceted stones and it'll work for cabs as well. Um, and delightfully, you can also find nested square wire. Oh. It's not quite as easy to set the square stones and you sometimes have to do a little touch up, but there's the nesting sizes. Pretty cool. So you can find rectangular wire. I have yet, I mean, rectangular tubing. I have yet to find a nesting set of rectangular tubing. And of course you can make your own. So you could make other shapes if you had a draw plate um, in another shape. I've seen people have hexagonal um, draw plates, which I would love to find one, but draw plates are obscenely expensive and unusually shaped ones as extra so. Um, so have fun with it. And if you, if you think, boy, I could never make tubing, it's, it's not as horribly hard as it seems like it might be. It's just a lot of muscle that you gotta do and patience. Um, and if you ever want to get into hinge making, invariably there will come a time when you need a specifically exactly the size, but not a size that anybody manufactures tubing. Um, and again, settings, your stones aren't always well calibrated, so you may need a different size of tubing. Um, so let's see. I'm going to do our nested round first. Did I get my nesting out? No, I didn't get the nesting piece out. Oh, maybe I did. Have okay. you ever have you ever nested like silver outside and brass or copper inside? You could absolutely do that. Um, I tend to do when I'm doing. Um, uh, I don't do it with the tubing bezels so much, but with the um, with the ones that we've been making the step bezels, the shoulder bezels. I tend to do gold exterior and silver interior if it's not going to show, or if it's a transparent stone that might get something from the reflective quality of silver underneath it. Uh, or if I want to blacken it, for example. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You could save some cost by putting your interior bezel. Just think about what's going to show to the customer. Like, is it going to be, is it a pair of earrings where you're going to back it? And so they won't see the, the brass interior tubing. And as long as you don't false advertise about what you're selling, you know, let them know that there's brass in there. Um, then go for it. It's definitely so, worth it with gold these days. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I was wondering, because I, I do have a bunch of brass and copper. Yep. And not that much silver, silver but I yeah. did buy some. Yeah, it's it's what what does your what's your look? What's your style? I don't tend to work much in copper and silver. Um so my my go to I mean, excuse me, I don't tend to work much in copper and brass. My go-to is silver. Um, as my baseline. And then on days that I can afford it, I work in gold. Um, but yeah, try it. 
brass is always harder um, to work with. It's literally physically harder. And I, I still describe it as the bitchiest metal. It's just grumpy. It doesn't like being soldered. It doesn't like being worked. Yeah, it's um, you're right. It is hard. <laughs> but it so, kind of duplicates gold. <laughs> a little bit. I, no, gold, gold I find easier to work with than brass by a long shot. Not, not easier than silver, but it's sort of what you started on. People who started in gold seem to think gold is easier to work with. People who started in silver tend to think silver is. Um, I'm using a tube cutting jig, but you could also use, if you don't have a tube cutting jig, you could also use your miter jig and just saw up against it. And then I'm going to show you one of the cool techniques John gives us for finishing tubing. So I'm just going to randomly pick something that's at least tall enough for my um, stone to sit down in and cut off a piece as my outer wall. I'm cutting my outer wall first. Use my tube jig if I can hold it in place today. Oh, because I didn't change out from that teeny tiny blade I was using for the uh, cornering. Uh, okay, hang on a sec. Let me up my blade size to something a little bit more robust than the three aughts. So I haven't gotten the tube setter yet because I heard that Hosted had really good ones but they're no longer making them and then I wasn't sure what to quite get but would you recommend Flow Studios? I don't know their stuff I can tell you that I was resistant to getting a setting set myself for so long that I finally just broke down and got whatever El Cheapo set is to play with uh -huh. and it works just fine for me but I don't do a ton of basic round settings. Um, I'm not, I'm not, a, there's not a lot of my work that needs that kind of detail. The only thing I do is some decorative add-ons to certain um, larger stuff. Like I'll, do, I'll put a Druzy with a single stone set near it. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, I've seen people who make their own because <laughs> it really is just a concave shape of mm -hmm. the right size. Mm -hmm. to wrap around the stone. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there are people who have strong opinions about brands that are better than others. I'm just not one of them on that particular tool. Well, what I liked about Hosted is you can get like one size. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but when I followed up with them, they said that you would have to be an instructor and order like quantities to resell like if you wanted to get an order through them and then you resell them but I couldn't just buy one because they would have to get like from their supplier they would have to get I don't know a gross or something I'm not sure got it they may be that may be a wholesale only item for them or something right okay. so they they don't sell it anymore so I just I've been hesitant because I have never done it, so but mm -hmm. I want to have the right tool. Is it going to be possible for me um, to set it without? Yeah, it? I mean, I think this set might have been only like thirty or forty dollars. It was a cheapo, cheapo. Okay. Um, but it, it is possible to hand set them. It's just that once you've seen how quickly these stones set with a round, with how it's only good for round stones. That's the downside of this tool. So once you see how quickly it lets you set them you may go, oh my gosh, I have to have that because it'll save me enough time to make it worth owning. Do you remember um, where I you got it? From? Pardon? Do you remember where you got it from? This was a Rio. This was the, whatever Rio's very basic set is. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I realized that I can't show you the John trick that I was going to because I'm using too big of a uh, tube for it. Um, but the, I'll, t I'll describe it and maybe we can do it on the inner, inner tubing. It might be small enough. Basically, if you're working on small tubing and need to get a nice flat surface, you can, as long as it's big enough to fit in the jaws of your Fordham or your micromotor, 
and then you put your micromotor in reverse if you have a reverse if you can't if you don't have a reverse you flip it opposite what you would normally do um and you run a flat file against it while it's spinning it will even out and give you a perfectly flat surface on the end of your tubing as opposed to having to sit here and sand it like we're going to so it's a cool trick and then you can do similar style things with small pieces if you're making the end of a pin back you can just put a file at an angle and spin it in the fordham and give it a, a nice point um, there's a lot of small work that you can do if it fits in the fordham draws um, if you have if these are too small for you to handle you can also put a piece of tape on the end of it to get it this is just bordering on too small for me So I'm just cleaning up the basic outer tubing. And then I'm going to find the tubing that nests right inside of it, which I've managed to put down right in front of my own face. Is that it? That's it. Okay. And I need something that is low enough down that I'll be able to set my stone, but also tall enough that the coolette of the stone doesn't fall through. So these are the stones I'm going to be setting in here because they just fit inside of the whole tubing. It's a smaller stone than what I was doing before because I'm not drilling any material away. So this one has to fit perfectly inside the outer tubing and it's then going to rest perfectly on the seat that we're about to build by putting another one. Get this where you guys can see it. So the inner tubing, it has to be able to fit just on top of, and then when this goes on the outside of it, it'll be a perfectly set setting. Is you don't next? have to solder it? You don't have to solder I'm, it? Oh, I'm gonna have to solder it. Yeah, I'm absolutely oh, gonna okay. have to solder this one. <laughs> but I need to okay. get my, uh, my height first. So what is the millimeter of the stone and what is the tube size? Uh, all good questions. I just went going through my tube stash, looking first for things that nested, and then I okay. found a stone I could use to demo with that would fit it. So let me see. We have, in this case, I am using a stone that is 5.29. So it's probably supposed to be a 5.3. Yep. Give or take. It's not a very well calibrated stone, apparently. Five point two five. It looks like it's just not perfectly round. Yeah, it's probably supposed to be a five point two five. Um, and then my outer tube is. Five point six six, five point six somewhere in there, five point six eight interior diameter. It's a heavy walled tubing, so its exterior is six point nine nine. It looks like six point nine eight, and then the interior one is hopefully going to be right snug inside of the other one. Five point eight. Come on. 5.61. What do we say this interior was? Hopefully 5.6 something. 5.69. So this, this must be at least 5.69 because it is fitting. Yeah, 5.69 exterior and interior here. Um, but again, I just have piles of tubing, so it's whatever I had on hand that I could find a stone to fit. Rachel, why, yep. use, why use a solid, um, a thick wall tube for your outside tube if you're gonna have to bend it over the stone? So literally because it's what I had. <laughs> okay. I don't have any thin walled nested tubing because I don't tend to use it much. Um, but you can absolutely do either. The other thing is, remember, just like if we were constructing this the way we did in some of the earlier sessions, 
you can always file down the top wall. Let me draw that one because it's a good reminder from like session two or something um, that we can modify our wall to make it easier to set. So we are building outer tubing. We're gonna put in an inner tubing that just sits there. And if this is thick, we can file down like that. And this was one of those drawings that in that session, I pointed out this aha moment I had when I was working through the book, which is I'd always thought you were supposed to file like that to thin it down. You're not, you're supposed to leave that top lip because what you're then doing is you're setting downward pressure on the flat surface to squeeze it in over the stone. So all we're doing is thinning it so that there's not a whole wall in the way. So if I'm using heavy wall tubing, I'll probably clean it up a little bit to that angle around the outer edge of the stone or of the, of the bezel rather. Make sense? Yeah. By the way, um, I did a workshop three years ago where the jeweler had... Um, a mechanical puller for the draw plate. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to draw down my my seamless tubing, we soldered a piece of solid skinnier metal on the end of it, yep. and then just drew it down a little bit. And that way we were able to get uh, matchings. Yeah, once you once you start playing around with draw plate draw um, tools, then you can absolutely modify existing ones. Um, and it's certainly worth doing. It's also that you should know how to make one from scratch if all you have is sheet, but the same principle, once you've got it, it turned into the tube, the same principles apply as when you're drawing down existing tubing, just like people draw down wire if they don't have the exact size. So what I'm checking is collect a table. What do I need as my minimum so that I don't have stone poking out the bottom? And that's about where I'm going to land, which seems pretty good. And I'm going to measure that on my inside diameter. Mark it so that people can actually see what I'm marking. And then we're going to cut this one too. With me. Okay. Same old, same old. We're doing a little bit of cutting. And just like with the outside tubing, we need to straighten it out a little bit. Okay, good. And I always want to take out the little lip that you get from cutting 
So I'm going to use either a round or a half round or a uh, crossing file and just ream out the little bit of extra material on the outside or on the inside rather, all the way around on both parts. Let's see how they nest. Looking pretty good so far. When we put it down flush, if our stone is happy being sitting in there, if it's below the seat line, you should be in good shape, okay? So now we're gonna pop over and solder this real quick. Itty bitty little bit of soldering. Rachel, what about beveling the inside too? You could. It's such a clean fit um, that I'm not worrying too much about it. But yeah, absolutely. If you were to bevel the wall that is touching the inside, um, so the outside edge of the inner tube, if you were to bevel that edge, it would give you a clean solder line. Um, this is such a nominally... Uh, invasive amount of solder that I'm just going to go straight to it. But you're right. When we talked with, we talked about when we were building our own, we definitely did that inner um, tube beveled. And that is all we need. Quick little solder. Very, very little solder. If you want to be really precise about it and make sure you're nice and clean, you'll flip it over to the other side. And if you can see any gapping, which if you've got well-fitted tubing, it shouldn't happen, but occasionally it does anyhow. You might want to put a little touch-up solder because ideally when you file this after we're done, when you clean it up, it's going to look like there's no second wall. So I'm just going to put a little extra solder to try and make sure that that is absolutely gap filled. Teeny tiny, bingo bango, quick little bezel. All right, questions while I toss that in the pickle and get our prior project out to look at the prongs. How far did you go with the burr? I mean, how do you how do you know how far to go? I know you were putting the stone in, but um, and then what type of burr? Uh, I used in this case uh, because again I was looking for what did I have sizes that fit the the stone and the tubing I had. Um, I used an actual setting burr. You could also use uh, a round burr. Uh, you could use a bud burr. Um, what? you're looking for is a place that will let the stone rest comfortably on the edge of it. You don't need to, it doesn't have to be perfectly fitting the angles of the stone. It has to have a position that it sits on, just like when we build them from scratch. We're not getting that exact angle in every time. Um, so I went down, uh, I'm gonna channel John far enough. <laughs> Um, you go slow and you just go a little bit in. And what I needed was, let me draw how far down it is relative to the stone. So if we have heavy tubing walls here, straight tubing walls, our stone needs to sit just below the material, right? So what we need is to drill to the point, if I'm using, uh, if I'm using a setting burr, my shape that it's drilling is gonna be this shape. 
I need my stone to fit just below that point. So I go in a little bit at a time and check it. And worst case, if I go too low, as long as I don't go so low that my stone will no longer fit, let's say I accidentally cut that far down so that my stone's hanging out down here, no biggie. I'm just gonna file away to that point. So I don't get more exacting than that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, out of the pickle, looking overly soldered at this point, um, I just tend to use snipping tools whenever I can for the basics, cleaning up the last of what's hanging over the edge from the bottom. Flinging little bits of metal all over my studio, probably into my iced tea. Um, and I can't, with the crossover, I can't get my stone in there until I've at least cut some away. So I tend to cut extra, extra long up towards the start of my curve to give myself enough room to play. And then I'll trim back later. Now I can see how my stone is going to set in there. And then I can decide how far onto the stone I want these to go. I'm going to pretend to set one so you can see. You don't need anywhere near that much. I could get away with, once the stone is actually in its position, I could get away with just the itty bittiest little bit of a point over here. Because remember, I also have the supporting walls that are going to be pushed in a little bit. So I could trim these way, way down. Somewhere down in there. Or if I want the decorative element, I can make them longer. But keep in mind that every time your prong extends that far, it's something that can catch on a sweater, on you know a, a branch or something, and it can get pulled away. So if you're counting on that support, you want to keep them close to the vest, just enough to be the decorative element that you designed them to be. But can't you imagine like doing these in like an 18 karat gold against the silver, it'd be gorgeous. You can blacken the silver and have the gold really pop. It's a great way to add a decorative element. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm not ever gonna push them down like this before I'm really ready to set. I just want you guys to see that it, you can size them very small from that. Let me get this back out. And I would, at this point, trim them to my chosen height. I'd measure so that I'm evenly set up, whatever I decided to be. I'd measure them in. And then I'd do a rough cutaway of the extra material. Like if I'm going to point these, I tend to cut an initial point above the spot I'm going to trim them down to. And then it's all filing all the time, taking a barrette file or something that won't get in the way and shaping your prong down to the forms that you want. Maybe taking a little off the top so you can get a curve or you could take a ball burr, excuse me, a cup burr and really give it a good curved round top which is done on a lot of wedding rings and things like that. Um, so I'm going to clean this up between sessions so you don't, don't have to watch me but if you want to see the magic of post cleanup. This one I already did my filing down. Rachel? Yep. So when you trim the prongs, is it the same measurement that you would use when you're setting the bezel height on a cab? So it's just where the stone starts mm -hmm. to curve over? It's a good question. Let me think about how I feel about that. Um, I, I personally tend to bring my prongs a little further onto the stone, um, primarily out of habit of when you're setting it only via prongs, you need a little bit more grip because you don't have the full coverage wraparound. 
Uh, but that may not actually be necessary. If it's decorative, if it's mostly decorative and you've left enough material that the wall is gonna do a lot of the holding, you could probably get away with some pretty tiny little amounts of prong action. Uh, I think you're gonna have to use your judgment depending on the curve of the stone. Like if you've got a really steep stone um, that goes straight up before it takes its curve and you've only put a little bit of a wall, you may need a taller prong. If you've got a shallow curve um, so that the, the wall frame is holding more of it just by the act of a tiny amount being bent over, or if, you're, if your outer wall is a thicker wall, um, which also holds it a little more firmly, then you could get away with a shorter prong. So it's case dependent. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Conceptually the same raised principle, you're right. It's, is it gonna hold the stone? Have I gone far enough up the curve? And, and other people may have different judgment calls on how far they want their prongs to go up. Yeah, any other questions out there? I would think that because you go through all that trouble, I would want it to be part of the piece, you know, as an added decorative. It's so absolutely, it, so it always should be decorative at least, but it's dependent on what else you're doing to hold the stone in place as, a, as to what its level of function needs to be. Mm -hmm. Added security for me. Yeah, added security. <laughs> And, and it is possible if you make it too long that it becomes less secure because it can catch on things. So the same rules of, of setting a prong setting cleanly so that you don't have a lot of gap between it um, and so that it's not sticking out in ways that will catch, those are all still in play as soon as you add a prong to it. It's just that you've got sort of like a safety catch in having a little bit of the wall up around it at the same time. That'll make a little more sense when we start seeing how uh, we set the basket settings, I suspect. Like in retrospect, you'll see the difference in, in where we put our prongs. Other questions? Okay, uh, let me just double check what my next one is. So we did the double wall drill, we did the heavy wall round. Um, do you want to see a square? on square tubing, it's really the same actions as the round, but I do have that set. Um, it's just, you're gonna watch me saw and solder again, just with square wire instead of round. Do we need to show that? No. I got one vote oh. for now. Is there anybody who feels strongly that they, I will make one, I promise, but I can make it off board and show you guys later if you wanna see that. My only question is cutting down the corners so that you don't have a squished corner. I did one recently and one of my corners was a little too deep and I wasn't very happy with it. Um, and, I, and I think one does cut the corners, right? So you were doing a nested uh, tubing version or were you building a, a built together wall frame? I honestly can't tell you. Okay, so in, in any case, in corners, remember that you should always be using a little ball burr and drilling a divot inside the corner where the, okay. where the corner will hit because it makes a little air pocket. You never want that sharp point to be right up against metal. So you're making a hollow for it. In terms of whether you're gonna file the shape of it down, there's a really great drawing from John when we do the square section. Let me see if I can quickly find that page. Uh, do his descriptions of the tops. Uh, if you go to, oh, no, that's not the drawing I'm looking for. Here's the finishing drawing. Yes, on page 74 of the book, he shows two different ways to finish your corners. And even though it's on a rectangle, it still applies to your question. One is that you do the corners um, as straight up as they are. You're just gonna saw with the super ultra fine, I think he uses an, 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 an eight-aught, an eight-zero blade. 
you're going to saw right down the corner so that when you're pushing in, what you're actually doing is using the saw as a file and getting it so that it's not going to trap that corner of the stone. There's st you still want to do that drill a divot with your, with your ball burr, but in that case, you're closing it down to make a full frame. And then the version on the right, he's taken, he's filed the corners away to give that sort of curved look. And it's the stone is really being held by the uh, interior, the outer walls, not the corners. So let me pop that page up on, that one page up on screen so you guys can see what I'm saying. I'm doing a bad job of describing this. So again, this is page 74 here. And this is the version where you saw down to your corners. And this is the version where you're filing away your corners and using the wall material, the side wall material to hold it in place. So the same holds true in one of these little tube settings. Does that help? Yes. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll skip me making a square version of that in favor of a couple other things. I wanna show you something that I recently had made that you could have made near you if you want to. I cannot stand the feel of paint sticks for my sanding sticks. So I went to my local plastic shop and had them cut and side polish some strips of about the same size as a paint stirrer. And then I'm using um, double-sided carpet tape to tape my sanding stuff down to it. So much more comfortable and it acts much like John's larger board where he has us put it against plexiglass. It has a good smooth surface for it. So that these cost me like $3.50, $4 each maybe. And I can make them in all my different sets. Just something to watch out for if it's of interest to you and you have the same, like I can't eat popsicle sticks with wooden, I eat popsicles with wooden sticks. It's, it's like fingers on a chalkboard to me. So I, I really can't use the sanding sticks. I'm trying to get more in tune with my sanding stick action. Um, and what else? We are at 645. So other than the square wall, I was going to start us on the double-ended setting that we see on page 77, double bezels. Let me go grab those materials. Oh, I already got them. I put them over on the bench. So this setting is particularly nice for um, the bullet settings, but it can also be used with tabs or with, um, with faceted stones equally. And it's kind of a cool little decorative element to add to the top of your bale or something like that is a little bling pointing out in each direction. In this case, what we're gonna be doing is making it for a bullet on each side. And uh, this was one where I had to make my own tubing um, because I didn't have the right size for these bullets. Just like in our prior setting, you want the outer bezel wall to be a very snug fit. So I think I used 22 gauges, so snug that I can't get the bullets back out yet. Um, I used 22 gauge for the walls of this, I think. Oh, come on. <laughs> These weren't that snug. Let me get my safety tweezers and safety pliers. At least I know the fit is right. Oh, come on. <laughs> Maybe we won't oh. be trying this setting today. Dental floss. That's yeah, it is that there's no, no place to put it in this particular setting. It wouldn't have pulled out either way because there's stuff on both sides. Let's see what I got. Hello. Okay. Somebody, whoever is talking on the phone may want to go on mute. 
Um, and I'm going to make this setting on the other piece that I cut because I'll figure out how to get the stones out shortly. But basically, you're starting out with the perfectly fitted tubing. And then just like, let's see, which exercise was it? We did an exercise where we made a square um, wire step instead of making a walled step. In essence, that's what we're doing here. If you're doing a cab, whether it's a bullet cab or whether it's a regular old cab, um, it can be out of square wire because there's no uh, coulette pointing down. But if it's not, you need something wide enough that the two stones points aren't gonna bump into each other in the center. So your proportions on this would have to be bigger for us, uh, say, if I were doing you know, two of these faceted stones together, one pointing out each way, because I need my center section, the invisible, I'm gonna draw this because it's so tiny that it's not gonna make sense if I'm waving my fingers at you guys. So we're making the inside segment here. Right, we're gonna make a band that sets here. And with a cabochon, it's all well and good because the cab is gonna start here and come out, or it's gonna start here and come out. But as soon as we use a faceted stone, there's material coming out the bottom from each stone and we don't want them to bump, right? So the segment that was, let's try that drawing again. So we need to just make a longer initial tube that gives us enough room that we can put in a wide interior ring in here. Wide enough that it is at least twice this distance, right? My flashy, flashy stones. Is that making sense? My little diagram that now looks like a set on sand glass, sand, whatever those are yeah. called. Yeah, all you wanna do is make it big in the middle. Big in the middle. So they don't yep. touch. So with the, with the cabs, I can, I can make my centerpiece as a single bit of wire. I'm just saying, make sure that you're using another piece of tubing or another piece of sheet in the inside that's big enough if you're doing a faceted stone. So I'm literally gonna make a little jump ring for this because I'm using cabs that is the right size or crazy lazy me, I might go just happen to go check my jump rings and see if I have anything that's kind of close because this could be square wire, it could be round wire. Um, if I have a jump ring that's just a little too small, for the inside, I can always stretch it once I solder it. Too big. Worst case is I make my own, but I would be surprised if I don't have something that's pretty close. Yeah, that looks like that's about as perfect a size jump ring as I could ask for. So I'm gonna start with a jump ring. Again, if you're doing this at home and you have different size stones relative to the tubing and you just don't happen to have a jump ring handy, make your own out of square or round wire. Square wire might actually be a little easier for sitting this down. I'm gonna pop over and solder this together. Hard solder, just a quick drop over on the jump ring. Boom, that was nice and easy. Back to fitting these together over at the bench. And just like with our one part bezel, you know, our single stone bezels, the fit needs to be snug. It can't be wiggly wobbly. So if this is too easy, like if I can just 
dump, dump it down and it can fall through. I'm gonna actually size this up a tiny bit. I can put it on my pliers and do a little squeeze to it, or I could hammer it bigger if, it's, if I'm working much bigger than this. I'm just gonna try and size it up a smidge because what I want is for it to almost get stuck inside the bezel. Oops, before I do that, I wanna take all the, I forgot to file the insides of this piece. That's one of the reasons it's going from one side and not the other. There's my little file. One of the nice things about this setting, especially if you're using it for say, the decorative element at the top of the bale, is you can do some, some cool pattern wire on the outside of your tubing. Um, you could again add some gold as a decorative element or another metal. You could even, if you make one the right size, you could put a little faceted stone in a um, traditional cup setting on the outside of it. So you got stones pointing out in all directions. Lots of cute variations you can do with this. All right, so now we're at a slightly snug fit and I'm going to put this down to the center of my setting. I wanna get it equidistant and I wanna get it upright inside the setting. Which takes a little more patience than it should, or rather it takes a little more patience than I always have with getting that exact fit. But it's supposed to be, what makes it work is to get it evenly set out. Because if it's not flat, your stones will also look funny when they're set. Oh my goodness, come on, center. So a trick for getting this at least flush is if you have some straight round device that is of the right dimensions to fit in the center of the tube, but not much, but fairly snugly, then you can put something in from one end and have that be the flat that it goes against. And then, for example, I know that I have a, a piece of tubing that fits better into this. I can flatten it out, that'll help straighten things. Then it's a matter of figuring out the positioning. Come on. And that's close, but not quite where I want it. Right. And I just want to check how my measurements are doing left to right. I think I'm a little closer on one end than the other. So I think I still have to push this further down. Yeah, I'm definitely farther off on one side than the other. Right. We're looking pretty good. We're looking pretty level. I'm popping over to the bench. And once again, because it's a closed tube and it's the first solder, except for that little seam I did inside, I'm going to stick with hard solder. Because I'm using a round uh, jump ring, I don't need to worry about that beveling that you might need to in certain circumstances, like we talked about on that last tube set.
I'm just putting a tiny bit of solder in and getting it to flow. Quick like bunny. There we go. All right, so my platform is set for each end. I would pickle this and clean it up and probably put some kind of a jump ring or something on it. And then as soon as I can actually get my stones back out of the other one that I cut for the tubing, I would be able to set my tube, my settings in here, just as a standard setting. Um, if you're using a faceted stone, you might wanna sort of combine things and maybe make it out of thick walled tubing with a little bit of extra material. Nothing says you can't do, um, you don't have, you know, nothing says you can't do a two-ended thick walled tubing bezel for your faceted stones. You just cut a stretch of it, drill both ends, and instead of do that instead of putting in the interior. But double-ended, nice and easy. Similar uh, things can be done for other shapes of stones. You just don't get the luxury of using a tube. You're going to have to do, for example, a tongue setting, which we will be playing around with later. Um, you'd, you'd have to actually build your frame instead of building your tube and then build the interior and just, again, position it in the right spot. So this concept works in all the shapes we've done so far. I can't say that I would delight in the idea of doing a two-ended uh, emerald cut, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> But the other settings, if you have the patience to make something that is well fitted to both sides, you can, in fact, get it to go from both ends of the stone. And it's a nice addition. Questions, yeah. gang? Yeah. And in the book, there's two rings, but you can get away with just one ring, right? I don't think that's, that's actually two rings. I think that no? is his way of drawing the ends of the um the ends of the uh piece that you're putting in the middle he's showing it going into the tube i could be wrong i mean there's nothing that says you can't do separate rings mm -hmm. but it's two fittings and two soldering so why bother because it's not going to be seen by anyone no um so next session we get to do the one that I have never done before, which is the cup bezel. It's not what we normally think of. Like if you're like me, a cup bezel is one of those pre-manufactured things that you get from Rio. Um, but he's doing it as an actual domed and dapped, and it's designed specifically for very tall stones. So I have some really tall bullets, and probably we will get to a tongue setting next time as well. But, but there's a couple of variations on how to set those cups sometimes with a ring that holds it and sometimes with walls that hold it um and then what else do we have in this book then we have conical settings and in reverse settings which reverse settings are really wonderful um and another one that i've never done which is the briolette or um teardrop cone settings towards the end of this chapter and then we get to move on to setting and chapter four, finally, which is like gonna feel lightweight by comparison to all the, all the number of stone settings we've had here. Um, I think if there's any other reminders that I wanna give you, and then we'll see what people wanna show if anybody's got some show and tell. Uh, I talked at the beginning, although I don't know if everybody was on for it about, I have several classes coming up. May is my Holoforms class. I've just added a Metalworks virtual class in July, which is a variety of different clasps, starting with wire-based clasps and moving on to more me mechanical ones. Um, and then at the end of the year is gonna be my Bezels Less Ordinary, which goes into fancier versions of some of the ones we were showing here and some completely different settings than what are in John's books. Um, what else do we need to know? think that is enough. So next time it'll be cup bezel and conical and tongue settings. Any questions? This was a little bit more whirlwind than our others, but they were quick settings. Um, I have a question about that double bezel. I think I missed part. Okay. So how did you make sure the jump ring was even in the middle? 
I, I'm sorry, not uh, even. How did you make sure the jump ring was in the middle of the tube? So I took um, the the hard part was getting it to be flat in the middle of the tube. So it, it wants to tip one way or the other. And that was when I pulled out something that fits inside that has an end. So I was just resting it on there. And I mm -hmm. used that as the platform to jam it into the spot upright, you know, perpendicular. And then what I was checking with was I was using my calipers in multiple spots around the edge from one side and then from the other to make sure that it was the same distance each direction. Worst uh, case is if you're off by a smidge, you just file one side down, uh, but it's better to start in good shape than, than not. If, you, okay. if you're concerned about it, give yourself a little extra tubing and file it back at the end. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, Rachel. I had to go to my five-year-old grandson's open house. <laughs> <laughs> so Why is your five-year-old having an open house? <laughs> it's a little kindergarten cute. class. So. Oh, nice. So, oh, that kind of open house. I was like yeah. showing the house kind of open house. Oh, oh, oh. No, kindergarten. So send me the link. I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, okay. the link will go up. Uh, so the, uh, the link is now, from now on out, the link is the same. It's my YouTube channel. It's just okay. going to take me, it's however long it takes to process longer okay. videos take more days for me to process and it depends on what my work schedule is like. So usually I've been getting them within five to seven days after each session. Good. Any other Hello. questions on today's settings? You'll get to see them all in their polished state for next time. Today was a great day. Good. Good. Yeah, these were <laughs> kind of like boom, 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 but they're just modifications of what we've already done. So I'm hoping they connected for you all. Um, a reminder that, so it seems like probably by at least the second session in June, if not the first session in June, depends on how long it takes us to do stone setting before that, um, you'll probably want to have at least one pair of straight steel uh, cross-locking tweezers. This is one of those tool mods that is a game changer for making prong settings. Um, I like to have more than one because I've managed to snap even the steel ones um, when making this mod. And if you happen to have an excuse to say, drink a bottle of wine, hang on to your cork. The cork will be, uh, or, or find a scrap of wood. You can use like the wedge from your, um, from your, your uh, ring clamp or something like that. But uh, a wine cork is a good holder because we need to hold the jaws open when we do the mod. Um, but you do not want any of the titanium tweezers or anything for that. Those will snap when we, if you try this mod on them. So that's for prep if you want to play along at home. Um, I like to have at least two of those personally that are modified because I sometimes want to pull more than one thing at a time. And what else? But that's, you have at least until June. I feel like I'm forgetting some big update that I wanted to give you guys, but I don't know what it is now. It's been that kind of a day. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've got shows. If any of you are East Coast based, if you're New York based, come see me in a few weeks at the Lindhurst Mansion, the Lindhurst Estate in Terrytown, New York at the Art Writer Show. Or if you're West Coast based and you happen to be near Portland, I'll be at Gathering of the Guilds. Come by and say hi. Um, and I've got other shows coming up, but my brain is full of those two right now. So anybody have stuff they want to show today? Anything. What have you been doing with your stone settings? Anything? I was out of town. I have an excuse. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, I can't see who's talking. Hang on, let me let me switch to speaker view. Gallery, who is? Oh, Saren, nice. Okay, let's see. So I finally got around to setting a double-ended tube setting. Let Ooh. me pin you. So, oops, nope, that's not it. I want to... Continue. Can you guys see her big scaled or do I need to still pin her a different way? No, she's not pinned. I don't she's think. not pinned. Hang on a sec. Let me try again. Oh, that's hold beautiful. On, hold on a sec, Saren. I'm getting there. Uh, spotlight. That's what I need. Nope. It hit the wrong person. Oh, oh my goodness. Go. There we go. Okay. Nice. Uh -oh. um, on one hand, I have a lab grown Alexandrite stone. So that's 
really pretty color change goes from kind of gray through blue and purple to pink. And then on the other side, I have uh, a lab grown emerald. So nice. that's that same what Rachel was talking about with just making sure your, your culettes don't touch in the middle. Um, and I did this with thick wall tubing. So I was just carving away from my seat rather than trying to arrange it. So it was neat to see the other way of doing it, Rachel. Cool. It's beautiful. Thank you. Nice. Anybody else? Okay, then let us call it a night. And I will see you again in two weeks if you are joining me for that intriguing looking little cup bezel setting that we've got. Cup, cup setting? Cup bezels, he's calling them. That's going to drive me bonkers. <laughs> All right, gang, have a good night. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. See you next time. Good luck with Thank you. Bye-bye.